Cool. All right. So uh, if you don't know me already, my name is Jeff Fittardo. I'm a relatively new faculty in the entomology department. Uh, I joined in 2017. Um, so my kind of specialty is uh, insect disease vector reproductive physiology. And I'd say for the past, since 2004, I've been working on tsetse flies, which are kind of a, it's a little off the beaten trail. It's probably something you guys don't talk about too much. So hopefully this will be uh, interesting. Uh, so uh, before I worked on tsetse flies, I worked on mosquito reproductive biology. But um, after doing, finishing my PhD there, I heard about the kind of crazy biology associated with this fly, and I was really intrigued, and there was nobody doing any kind of molecular biology on it. So I ended up going to, uh, to work on this for a while. And this is kind of, I'm going to talk about a couple of the projects we worked on that I think really highlight the unique aspects of this system. So uh, if you're not aware, tsetse flies are the sole vectors of human and animal uh, African trypanosomiasis. The animal form is called Nagana. So trypanosomiasis is spread throughout sub-Saharan Africa. And then there are actually two forms of the disease which are caused by two different uh, strains of trypanosomes. One's called Trypanosoma brucei gambiense. The other strain is called Trypanosoma brucei rhodesiense. So gambiense causes about 97% of all the trypanosomiasis cases, and it's predominantly in Western Africa. While rhodesiense causes um, the last 3%, but it causes an acute form of the disease. So Gambiense tends to kill people over a period of uh, months to years, uh, usually one to three years. Uh, so it's a long kind of chronic form of the disease. And Rhodesiense causes a more acute form, which can kill people within uh, six months. But both of these diseases are 100% fatal if they're left untreated. So um, they don't have the numbers that malaria and dengue do, but they, the, in terms of the seriousness of the infection. It's, it's not something to, to write off. What, yeah. Share your screen. Oh, yeah, sure. What are the yellow dots in your blood spot slide? Uh, let's see. Was it the previous slide? Yeah. Okay. I'm not going to interfere. Okay. <laughs> did, it, did it chair? Well, I haven't. No. Okay, let's share that one, this one, and the slideshow or screen to the end. I think that's what we want. Okay. All right. So let me know if it's not, if it's not showing up on there. And that's great. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's see here. Yellow dots. Oh, these. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually not sure. I wonder uh, if these are white blood cells, maybe. Okay. Uh, that have been, this is obviously artificially colored, so yeah. somebody may have just colored those in. Okay. They might be but they have nothing pages. to do really with the parasite. No, not really. It's just kind of a picture to show what the trypanosomes actually look like. So they're single celled eukaryotic parasites, so a little different from bacteria or. So, tetsy are exclusive to sub Saharan Africa. At one point, they were in the United States because they've been fossilized or main spent. Colorado shale, but they are no longer around. So they're really uh, specific to that band, uh, called the Tetsi band, that's below the Sahara Desert and above the uh, above South Africa. So they're the sole vectors. Both males and females act as vectors, and that's because both sexes blood feed. So this, they differ from a lot of other vectors in that sense. It's a very unique biology. Uh, in that these guys um, lactate and they give birth to live offspring. So uh, there aren't many insects out there that do that. And Tetsi has really taken it to kind of a, a ridiculous extreme. Uh, so because of this biology, they tend to reproduce pretty slowly. And that makes actual uh, vector control a fairly popular way of preventing trypanosomiasis. So, the population numbers aren't at the densities like you see with, with mosquitoes and other, other uh, vectors. So trapping of tsetse flies uh, tends to be a functional way of, of doing this. So 
So this is a video from a uh, so some field work we were doing in Africa. So this kind of just shows you the traps that they are that are used to to collect tsetse flies in the wild. The trap is made of the fabric, so the tsetse flies are very oriented. They really dial in because the frequency of pollen that comes off of this little. <laughs> These traps can pull out a lot of flies and a lot of Yeah, so we set that up at like nine. Stay with me. Yeah, so the lure is in part the color of the trap. So that dark blue color, and then it's also baited with um, octanol and uh, phenol to kind of simulate uh, buffalo urine. So those, <laughs> yeah, those two, those two components pretty much bring the flies in. So the the odorant kind of brings them in from a distance, and then they really home in on the colors of the trap to pull it in. That's not a particular reason for the blue. It really has nothing to do with buffalo urine. Yeah. <laughs> blue has nothing to do with buffalo urine. I have no idea how we, don't, we, don't know, we don't know why they're attracted to blue. I'm kind of wondering if it's because it's a particularly strong wavelength. Um, it's very rare in nature, blue. So yeah. And if you think about like when you go underwater, um, you know, blue tends to be the last wavelength that, that filters out. So it may just be a very, the strongest sort of visual output coming off of mm. maybe animal hides. Or something. That's my theory, but I don't know for <clears> sure. <throat> so what we've been doing comparative genomics and looking at the rhodopsins that are specifically associated with detection of these blue colors. But mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into that today, but well, uh, something for another time. Uh, so tetsi flies are very different from other flies. So this is a fruit fly uh, with actually some recombinant tetsi fly genes in it which I'll show you later. And then uh, this is an actual tetsi fly. So you can see they're much larger and um, more robust flies. So this is just another quick video kind of showing some of the key points of tetsi's biology in their life cycle. So this is a pregnant female fly. So the majority of her abdomen is filled with a larva. So this is our artificial feeding system. So we keep our flies in cages and then we have a mesh on the cage that allows the larva to drop out but keeps the adult flies inside of the cage. And then uh, they feed through a, um, uh, a membrane basically on a, a warmed glass plate that's got blood under it. You can see that these guys take a pretty huge volume of blood and both males and females Blood is their only source of food. We don't do any sugar feeding or anything like that, like you would do with mosquitoes. So it does make maintaining them a little more, um, a little more effort because they have to be fed three times a week. So uh, it's not like if you just want them to reproduce, you can blood feed them once and then you collect eggs later. So these guys require a pretty steady state flow of blood. Um, after they blood feed, they uh, condense the protein and excrete, excrete the excess water by a diuresis. And then in here, so this is a very pregnant female. You can see her belly is mostly larvae at this point. You can kind of see it moving around inside of the belly of the fly. So it's a pretty impressive uh, physiological adaptation. So a single larva? Yep, a single larva. So they only make one per gonotrophic cycle. So this is a female giving birth. So the larva gets, <laughs> so, yeah. So like that's the equivalent of giving birth to like an 18 year old and sending them off to college. <laughs> um, so the larva gets all of, its, all of its nutrition from the mother. There's no external nutrients. <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, so they burrow, they basically, the first thing they do is they look for a safe place and burrow under the ground and then they pupate within 30 minutes to 60 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they don't feed, so they're, they're, it's interesting from a microbiome perspective too because they're very uh, isolated from the environment. So this is just a larva that's wandering looking for a place to pupate and then within a short period of time after they they turn into pupa. 
and then after about three weeks, an adult fly will emerge out, and then the cycle starts again. When you said they lactate, uh -huh. when did they feed the baby? So they feed the baby while it's in the uterus. Oh, I see. Yep. Uh -huh. And I'll, I'll get into how they do that. So this is the reproductive tract from kind of a tip, stereotypical diptera uh, or fruit fly. So typically the ovaries have a number of ovarian follicles which are producing, which have germ cells at the top and are constantly producing eggs. And they're capable of producing uh, multiple eggs at a time, kind of like mosquitoes do. Tetsi flies have both ovaries, but they only have four follicles and only one follicle is ever active at a time. So we don't entirely understand how they're able to synchronize this in such a way where they're only developing one ovary yet they're, you know, all these follicles are within the same sort of environment in terms of like hormones and all that. So there's some way that developmental patterning in which they're cycling this process. And then the uh, egg is ovulated into this uterus, which has been sort of heavily modified uh, and adapted to stretch and accommodate the, the larva. And then, so in Drosophila, they have these little female accessory glands called the paraovaria. In tepsi flies, these have sort of expanded into what we call the milk gland, which is this set of bifurcating tubules that spread throughout the entire abdominal cavity of the female. So this is the, the organ responsible for synthesizing all of that milk. And the mother produces uh, her own weight, probably more than her own weight in milk, each gonotrophic cycle. So it's a massive amount of energy. So they're basically taking in blood, converting it to fat, mixing it with protein in the milk gland and then sending it into the uterus for the larva to feed on. Do twins ever happen? No. <laughs> <laughs> As you can see, there's not a lot of room yeah. for another one. In there. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, given the size of their blood meal, can you actually like, feel um, like when they're fighting? Or, like, is it painful? Yeah, if they are. They're not as refined as mosquitoes, so they don't go seeking capillaries under the skin. They actually go in and they go in and out uh, until they break capillaries open and they're, they're more pool feeders. So I've had bites before where I didn't feel them while they were biting and other times where it was like, you know, you knew you were getting bitten. And I think it's really, it's kind of mechanical. It depends on where they're biting you, if they get close to a nerve or something. So. We had one guy come out of the insectary at Yale who had one on his face, like full of blood. He didn't even know it. <laughs> yeah, so this is the gonotrophic yeah. cycle. Yeah. So it takes uh, about 10 days to produce the first egg. Then they ovulate that and uh, it's fertilized by sperm and the spermatheca. So it undergoes embryogenesis for four or five days. The embryo hatches into a first instar larva. And then the mother begins to lactate. And then the larva basically uh, undergoes three uh, larval instars within the uterus. So this takes about another five to six days. Then the mother gives birth, it pupates, and then you start over again. So why are we interested in tetsi fly reproduction beyond the fact that it's really cool? Um, so given the this is a very kind of slow form of reproduction, uh, it's kind of the ultimate K strategist. Uh, so by targeting this system, we're hoping that we can maybe develop some potentially novel ways of reducing tetsi fly numbers or exploiting the system in a way that we can optimize it to help with uh, tetsi control. So one of the things we wanted to do is try to understand what are the proteins that are in the milk? What, what is it that's nourishing uh, these females? How are these proteins regulated? Um, uh, so what's going on inside of the female? How are they sort of dealing, uh, performing these sort of evolutionary biology acrobatics? So these red tubules you see are the milk glands. So they've been stained with an antibody against um, a, the major milk gland protein or one of the major milk gland proteins. This big yellow thing is the larva in the uterus. And then these little white cells are fat body cells. So these are primarily just filled with fat. And then the milk gland is responsible for production of the protein. And then during pregnancy, there's a massive sort of uh, shift of fat going from stored fat in the fat body that moves into the milk gland where it gets incorporated into the milk. 
So this is some classic work by uh, an insect physiologist named Dave Denlinger um, back from 1975. So this was like the last time people had been working on tetsy reproductive biology, uh, which I felt like was a shame. But he did some really nice uh, EM work showing the actual structure of the milk gland. So if you sort of take the tube and cut it, it looks like an orange on the inside. So it has these large secretory cells that basically go around the perimeter with a lumen in the middle where the milk is. So inside of these cells, they have these, what are called storage reservoirs, where the proteins are synth synthesized inside the cell and then deposited into the storage reservoir. And then fat is also incorporated into this. So it's a way of holding on to the milk. And then once the larva uh, has hatched, these uh, reservoirs empty into the lumen and the, lumen, the milk flows down the lumen into the uterus where the larva can feed. And you can see on the inside of these cells, these are arrays of rough endoplasmic reticulum. So basically a protein synthesis factor. So these cells are just sort of giant manufacturing plants for protein and for incorporation of fat. Uh, down here, you can actually see one of the symbionts. So these are, tetsy flies have an obligate symbiotic bacteria called Wigglesworthia. So these live in the, uh, and intracellularly in the tissue in the gut and extracellularly in the lumen of the milk gland where they're vertically transmitted to the offspring. Are they bacteria? Uh, they are enterobacteria. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so we wanted to identify what the milk was. So what we decided to take sort of a, a, a high throughput analysis approach where we took dry females or non-lactating females, and we uh, also took lactating females, and we generated uh, RNA-seq libraries, and then compared for differential expression, and basically identified uh, transcripts that were specific or enriched in the lactating females. And then we um, took some larval gut proteins, so the larva when they come out of basically just a giant bag of milk. So you can just kind of cut them open and pull out milligrams of milk. So they're easy to get, easy to get materials from. So we did some um, proteomic analysis of the proteins that we found in the larval gut contents and then cross-referenced those with the, um, the transcripts that were upregulated in lactating females to kind of identify which proteins are being generated within the mother and then passed on to the offspring. Just whole body transcript. Yeah, we did a whole body transcript though. And then, so that gave us an array of these female derived milk proteins. And we came out, it was actually a very clear picture. It was very nice. So, this bottom axis is non lactating female uh, gene expression, and the y axis is lactating female gene expression. And then, anything sort of on this side of the line is uh, lactation bias. And you can see that there are a number of very clear outliers here that are highly upregulated in the female. Uh, there were a few that are grayed out here that are ribosomal uh, RNAs, which are obviously associated with protein synthesis. Um, so the, the constitute, there were really about 12 proteins that correlated with the proteomic analysis that we did. And when we look at the sort of level of gene expression in of these 12 genes in the transcriptome. So these numbers represent the percent of the total number of reads within the library. Uh, and this is a summary of all of these. So these 12 genes actually account for 47% of all transcriptional activity in the female during lactation. So it's uh, these, you know, there's a massive amount of effort going into a relatively small number of genes during lactation. What's also interesting is that uh, when we started comparing tetsy milk proteins with uh, mammalian and marsupial milk proteins, there were a lot of functional overlaps that we found. So we think that this may represent an example of convergent evolution. So the protein we call MGP1 or milk gland protein 1, this was the first one we identified, is a member of the lipocalin protein family. So these are small proteins that basically bind hydrophobic molecules. So we think that these are associated with binding the fats that need to go into the, into the uh, milk and helping to emulsify them in an aqueous solution as the, the base of the milk is water. And mammalian milk proteins have beta-lactoglobulin, which is also a lipocalin, 
which has some similar functional properties. We also found this enzyme called acid sphingomyelinase. So this sphingolipids are really important for development in cellular uh, cell membrane formation. They provide a lot of structure to cells. So uh, this one's interesting because it's only active under acidic conditions. So the, the milk gland itself is a neutral pH, but the larval gut is acidic. So the enzyme's actually sort of in stasis while it's in the female, but as soon as it gets sent into the offspring's gut, then it starts to activate and assist in larval digestion of these sphingolipids. And mammalian milk also have an abundant uh, sphingomyelinase activity. Uh, we also find an iron binding protein called transferrin. So this is associated with iron binding and transport. It's also been associated with immunity. So it sequesters iron out of the solution and prevents uh, other microbes from gaining access to it. It's also been shown to be important for develop, provides developmental cues, which may be important for larval development. And one of the major proteins in mammalian milk proteins is actually an ortholog of this called lactoferrin. And finally, we found this array of TETSI-specific proteins we call milk gland proteins 2 through 10. It's not very original, but it is what it is. Um, so these are somewhat similar to caseins. So caseins are another um, very abundant milk protein in mammals. And this is a family of mammal-specific proteins, which has ar arisen via a series of gene duplications. And these, both sets of these provide a, a, a complete amino acid source um, they both appear to have been derived from this sort of rapid uh, gene duplication events. And they also, both sets of proteins have lots of phosphorylation sites. So we think that these may function also not only as a basic protein source, but as a way of transporting phosphate from the mother into the offspring. The only big difference is that caseins are associated with transport of calcium, which is associated with the formation of an endoskeleton as insects don't have an endoskeleton, they don't really need that function. So, um, yes, very... But everything needs calcium for some metabolism. Yeah, yeah, but not to the extent that, like, you know, you're not building sort of a major part of the body out of it. I, I suspect there's enough sort of micronutrients in terms of, like, calcium that the larvae are getting enough of it to do what they need to do. But, I mean, obviously they are, but... We haven't actually ever Well, what's measured. interesting about that is, in just in terms of immunology, you hear, you know, things that vertebrates like to keep away from microbes are iron and calcium, mm. right? And yeah. so we've got them keeping the, so almost this, this immune function yeah. seems to be the more important component. Yeah, it may be. And we, we haven't really looked at exactly, we're still figuring out like the biochemistry of mm -hmm. these proteins mm -hmm. and what they're actually doing. We've been looking more at the molecular level of like how their genes are regulated and things mm -hmm. like that. So. It's definitely projects for the future. So we lo started looking at, we got the genome for, for the Tetsi fly, and we were kind of interested to see how, the, how these genes have evolved. So most of these milk proteins are specific to Tetsi flies. So this is the neighborhood for MGP1, which is probably the most abundant protein. So this shows the RNA-seq reads mapping to this region of the chromosome in lactating and non-lactating females. So this is MGP1. You can see there's a, a very large number of reads associated with here and very low number of reads in non lactating females. What's interesting is there's a, what appears to be a gene duplication just downstream of it, which isn't active at all, but it is homologous to the milk protein 1 gene. So that seems like maybe it was a duplication that just didn't work out. Um, there's also a gene called neurolazarillo, which is also a lipocalin, which is upstream. And this is also found in Drosophila. So this is an orthologous sequence in, in fruit flies. But fruit flies don't have those two MGP sequences. So that's kind of a key difference. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is, there, is there anything with the split reads, or is that just uh, when you go back oh. to the top one, is that just a depth issue? Yeah, this is, uh, um, I'm trying to remember what was causing it. I believe it was repeats that were in the reads. So there were a lot of reads that were just, they couldn't quite position okay. where they were supposed to go to, so. Yeah, so we've recently sequenced um, actually five more Tetsi fly genomes. 
And then, so what we did was we looked at the same locus in all of these genomes, and all of these genomes basically have the same pattern. And then this is this, the equivalent locus in fruit flies. So this is the neural Lazarilla gene. And actually just downstream of fruit fly, of neural Lazarilla, there's another lipocalin, which isn't in Tetsi, but we wonder if maybe this could have been a precursor to one of these milk proteins long, long ago. Uh, but the pattern we're seeing is that this is a very conserved feature. And then when we did a, a sort of phylogenetic analysis of these milk proteins across all six species, we found that, um, so this is that, that Drosophila lipocalin. This is the Drosophila neurolazarillo. These are the neurolazarillo orthologs and tetsi flies. And then this is the milk protein up here. This is the sort of non-functional milk protein here. So they all cluster well together. So these all seem to have originated from a, you know, tetsi precursor a long time ago, about 35 million years ago when they were first predicted to have evolved. When we look at the, uh, so in these casein-like proteins, we also see that these are all positioned in the same locus in the genome. So there's uh, nine of these proteins. And you can see they appear to have originated from this protein. And then when we start looking in terms of similarity, you can see that they appear to have evolved through a series of gene duplications over time. And they all have the same, same genetic structure with two exons and a single intron. And if we look at the uh, RNA-seq mapping to this region, so a lot of this is because these sequences are actually very similar to each other. So some of the reads are, you know, mapping to both. So it was giving the, the, uh, the mapper some fits. But um, so you can see exactly where they're active. There are also two here that are kind of homologous to these uh, MGP proteins, but also lack expression. So these also appear to be sort of like false starts or duplications that just didn't work out. And interestingly, these, I mean, it's not terribly surprising, but basically this locus is almost identical in all six tetsi fly species that we looked at. So this is a very conserved functional locus for, for tetsi flies that is found in no other flies that we've found so far. So it's kind of interesting, and um, these proteins really don't look like anything else in the NCBI database. If we blast them, nothing comes up, so. Uh, and this just shows that they all appear to be kind of fairly closely related to each other. They all cluster nicely. So these proteins are very uh, tightly transcriptionally regulated. So they come up at, um, so this is the first ovary developing. This is the first em uh, egg up ovulating to the uterus, it's undergoing embryogenesis, and then it hatches into a larva, and then you can see as soon as the larva is hatched, the gene expression goes up. And as soon as the mother gives birth, it drops right down again. And then uh, we have the same process. So these genes come up kind of ryth rhythmically with the whole the pregnancy cycle. So there's a very tight transcriptional regulation of these genes. They're also very tissue and uh, sex specific. So this is a uh, RT-PCR of each of these genes in different tissues throughout the fly. So this is male and female. So you can see that they're predominantly in the female. And this is the fat body milk gland fraction. We can't separate the fat body milk gland by dissection. It's just not, not feasible. But you can see that they're all very restricted to that particular tissue. Something I was interested in looking at is how how are these genes being regulated? How do these genes know when the female's pregnant? How do they know when to go on and off? So what we did was we looked at the, the region upstream of the gene. So this is the regulatory region, basically the on-off switch for, for the gene. Uh, and what we wanted to do is try to figure out um, what parts of this are really important for uh, gene expression. So we can't do transgenics in, in tetsi flies. But what we wanted to do is see if this would work in fruit flies. So what we did was we took the regulatory region and we dropped it in front of a nuclear GFP or green fluorescent protein. And then we cut down parts of the promoter basically to see at what point it broke. 
And what we found is that, kind of to my surprise, is that it actually worked. Um, is that these uh, reporter genes are being specifically expressed in the accessory glands, which are the evolutionary precursor of the milk gland and tsetse flies. So even though Drosophila doesn't actually have milk proteins, it still appears to contain the regulatory apparatus required for tissue and stage-specific expression of these genes. So these genes have basically co-opted a regulatory sort of um, cycle that, that regulates their tissue and stage-specific expression. Uh, we wanted to see if these genes were um, uh, regulated according to the um, reproductive activity of the fly. So in Drosophila, they pretty much just reproduce all the time. But if you put them on a minimal media and restrict their diet, they will stop reproducing. So what we did was we put one group on control media, another on minimal media, and then looked at the number of eggs they were producing per day. And then we looked at our transgene and we found that the transgene actually drops equivalently to the sort of level of egg production in the female. So this, this uh, transgene also appears to be regulated, is somehow responding to the reproductive activity of the tissue. So I'm cur currently working on a grant to kind of uh, try to suss out the actual signaling system that's regulating this whole process. So we identified a, a transcription factor uh, called a homeodomain protein, which appears to bind at the, this promoter. And when we knock it out, it actually eliminates the uh, transgene expression. So, uh, but what the actual signals are that are turning these on or off are not well. We don't know what they are. But we're thinking if we can disrupt this whole system, maybe this could be used as a way to sort of block reproduction in, in adult flies. Okay, so I'm gonna move quickly on to uh, the other project that we're working on, which is uh, symbiosis in reproduction. So as I mentioned before, tsetse flies have this Wigglesworthy symbiome, and this lives in a tissue called the bacterium that's attached to the gut. So they live intracellularly here, and then you see them extracellularly in the lumen of the, of the milk gland and are passed on to the larva. So if we treat flies with antibiotics, basically they start to abort their larva. They no longer are able to um, maintain the pregnancy cycle. So this is just an in situ staining with a, um, a RNA probe showing exactly the localization of these bacteria. Initially, we thought that they couldn't live extracellularly because they have a very reduced genome, but they are able to survive in the lumen of the gland and in the milk. So I would love to be able to try and generate like a milk substitute that we could culture these guys and try to do some biology with, but we haven't had a chance to do that yet. So if we treat with tetracycline, so if we give them a blood meal spiked with tetracycline, we can go from this, this is a healthy bacterium, to basically kind of a wasteland where we knock out all the, all the uh, symbionts. And these flies are really, um, have a number of issues. Uh, so they lose their ability to melanize cuticular wounds. Uh, so that if you poke them with a needle, they will actually just bleed out basically. Um, the paratrophic membrane doesn't develop properly. Uh, hemocytes don't differentiate, so they're immunocompromised. Uh, they have an increased susceptibility tr to trypanosome infection, and they will actually, so as I mentioned before, they will abort developing intrauterine offspring. Something interesting within the Wigglesworthy genome, so it's extremely reduced, but it has retained all these genes that are required for vitamin B biosynthesis. So they have the pathways for vitamin B7, B2, B9, B5, B1, B6, uh, and heme and B3. So this is, you know, you would think that they would have lost these if these weren't essential for some reason. So these appear to be kind of an important part of the relationship between them and the tsetse fly. So what we wanted to do is try to figure out what's happening metabolically in these flies that are um, normal versus uh, once treated with tetracycline. So we, we age matched two sets of flies. We treated one set with tetracycline and then we collected bacteriums 
hemolymphin fat body milk gland and did metabolomics on these different tissues from these two treatments. So we did a principal component analysis of our samples. Uh, so this is the, so this is fat body milk gland here. So you can see we get pretty nice clustering of our replicates. Uh, we have aposymbiotic and pregnant bacterium tissues here. And then in the hemolymph, so this is aposymbiotic hemolymph, pregnant hemolymph. We see more variability in the hemolymph samples, but they are still pretty clearly um, divided. I might need to reshare the screen. I don't know if this is. Okay. Okay. Let me just make sure it's gone to the right. Okay. <coughs> I'm going to. Sharing and then share the. Okay. Now, if I can just get this to show up on the. Yeah, let me see. Let me see if I can drag it over. Okay, so what we did was we were trying to figure out how to display this information because you get these massive spreadsheets. So what we decided to do is do it graphically. So the size of the circles represents the difference between the treatments. Blue represents uh, increased in aposymbiotic, red represents decreased, and green represents um, compounds we think are derived from uh, Wigglesworthia. So we found that the uh, kind of according to our predictions that the B vitamins were significantly impact. So the B vitamins themselves and also the metabolic precursors. Is that? It's, it's not. not uh, okay. But it's, I think, okay, because they can see it here. Oh, uh, okay. Unless this is going to be really long. Uh, <laughs> might be a little, it, let's see. Share that screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So basically, so under normal circumstances, you have Wigglesworthia, yeah. and then we looked up what metabolic pathways these vitamin B compounds were associated with. So we found that B6 is important for glycogen metabolism, sphingolipid metabolism, and pretty much all amino acid metabolism. It functions as a cofactor for enzymes required by these pathways. And then vitamin B1 is uh, really important for this pentose phosphate pathway, which is like a, a key sort of clearinghouse for all the carbon moving through the uh, metabolic system. When we knock out Wigglesworthy with antibiotics, so these percentages represent the percent of the normal amounts, so 100 percent would be normal. So we, we're seeing that these sort of outputs of these uh, metabolic pathways are, are significantly reduced, and in particular, the pentose phosphate pathway has this compound called phospho, phosphoribosyl pyrophosphate, or PRPP, which is actually at 0.62 percent of normal. And this compound is really required for any kind of amino acid biosynthesis, or not amino acid, on uh, nucleotide biosynthesis. So it basically functions as the backbone for nucleotides. What's interesting in the glycogen metabolic pathway, so there's this enzyme called glycogen phosphorylase, which requires vitamin B6 for it uh, to be functional. So these compounds are basically sort of 
larger versions of the, gl the glycogen molecule, and as you get down further, they're knocking off glucose molecules. So we're seeing an overabundance of unprocessed glycogen and an underabundance of sort of the more processed glycogen, kind of suggesting that this enzyme's not functioning the way it should be. Normally what happens is it pops glucose molecules like a Pez dispenser off of these glycogen molecules and feeds them into this pathway to go into either glycolysis or the pentose phosphate pathway. So if we look at the pentose phosphate pathway, we can see that here's the glucose coming in. Uh, all the enzymes in this pathway are actually down-regulated transcriptionally. This enzyme here in particular called uh, transketolase is dependent upon vitamin B1, a thymine. And uh, this enzyme is required for the creation of uh, PRPP, as I mentioned before, is really, it's the lowest, uh, most impacted metabolite in the, in the system. So the PRPP comes into this uh, nucleotide biosynthesis synthetic pathway here and flows down and is required for the production of adenosine. Uh, and we see significant impacts on adenosine and adenine. So these basically are required for ATP, which obviously is really important for, for biochemical reactions. And it's also important for the production of another cofactor called um, SAM, or s methionine. So this is the second most used cofactor in biological systems, and it's required for any reactions that need to move a methyl group from SAM onto a new molecule. So any methylation re reactions require SAM. And SAM is basically the combination of adenosine and methionine. And both of these compounds are being impacted. So it's having a significant detriment to the production of this methylation uh, cofactor. So we were trying to think, okay, we're seeing a lot of issues, but how does this relate to pregnancy? So uh, lipid metabolism is really important for pregnancy. They have to get all this fat that's stored in the fat body into the, into the milk gland during pregnancy. And the fact that the females are aborting larvae during pregnancy suggests that there's maybe malnutrition going, going on or something like that. So we wanted to look at how any of these imp might impact lipid biosynthesis. And we found a connection with um, biosynthesis of phosphatidylcholine. So phosphatidylcholine is a charged phospholipid, which usually goes on the outside of uh, uh, lipid membranes, and it forms sort of a charged outer surface. And this is, this is synthesized from phosphatidylethanolamine, which has a single methyl group. And then what they do is they take SAM and take a methyl group and pop it onto the ethanolamine. They take two methyl groups, which ends up creating phosphatidylcholine. But if you lack the SAM, you aren't able to actually produce uh, phosphatidylcholine from phosphatidylethanolamine. So we had a hypothesis that this was impact. So phosphatidylcholine is really important for the formation of lipid droplets, which are the primary storage form of fat in the fat body tissue. So these are little droplets that are basically neutral lipids in the center surrounded by an outer coat of phosphor phosphatidylcholine. Uh, so what we did was we stained some fat body tissue from normal flies and aquasymbiotic flies with a dye called Nile Blue. So Nile Blue stains different lipids with different colors. So it stains charged lipids like phosphatidylcholine uh, deep blue, and it stains neutral lipids uh, pink. So what we see in the normal conditions is that these fat bodies have a nice kind of a deep blue color to them. But when we look at the aposymbiotic ones, we can see that these cells are actually kind of distorted. These have a nice kind of oval shape to them, whereas these are really circular and they're packed. And they're also a lot pinker than these are. So it seems like there's a deficiency in charged lipids in these tissues. So what we think is happening under normal conditions is that the fat droplets are basically being encased by this phosphatidylcholine, and then these little blue things are the lipases that go in and basically are metabolizing these neutral lipids and mobilizing them to be uh, sent out to the, to the milk gland. 
So the choline provides a positive charge on the outside. So that positive charge causes these lipid droplets to kind of repel each other from, from each other. So it produces these small lipid droplets, which provides a lot of surface area for these enzymes to be able to function on. What we think is going on, this is the hypothesis that we're working on, is that in, under aposymbiotic conditions, you don't have this positive charge on the outer surface of these lipid droplets, so they end up webbing together. Like if you put fat into water, you see it just kind of all clusters together. So the phosphatidylcholine acts kind of like a detergent, basically, which breaks up the fat to smaller droplets. But because you have these larger droplets, you have a significant loss in surface area and a significant loss in the ability of lipases to actually access the lipids that are there. So what we think is happening is that these flies have like the equivalent of fatty liver disease in mammals. So this is, um, it's a phenomenon where the liver basically accumulates fat and is not able to be mobilized. It's just trapped there. Uh, let's see. Switch back now. Oh, it came up. Okay, good. Okay, so we recently published this in this paper in Proceedings B. And um, what was interesting is when we were doing some research on this, is that um, some recent work in rats showed that rats that were put on a vitamin B6 deficient diet actually develop a fatty liver disease phenotype. And they're able to um, recover that phenotype by supplementing their diet with phosphatidylcholine. Um, they also showed that uh, S-adenosyl methionine and phosphatidylcholine are really important in uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So there seem to be a lot of parallels in terms of lipid metabolism between our tetsi flies and, and vertebrate systems. So we're, I'm working on an oral uh, NIH grant to look more into how the system might be working and exactly at what point the phosphatidylcholine biosynthesis is failing, try to understand what's going on with the system. Um, so that pretty much wraps that up. So I just wanted to thank my previous lab mates in the Axoy lab who I was doing a lot of work with, um, in particular, Josh Benoit, who's at University of Cincinnati now, and Veronica Mikulkova, who really helped a lot with the, the reproductive or the um, milk gland, uh, milk protein work. And then this is my current lab. So Nicole is my tech. And then you guys may know Taylor and Lindsay, who, who just started this year. So they're doing more mosquito work. So that's another aspect of the lab. Uh, but yeah, so that's pretty much it. So thanks.